Today, we're talking about the love of God. Last week was on peace and it ministered to people. Our prayer has been, God, would you please just continue that deep work in our lives? Because we're not talking about a squishy love, a kind of a pipe dreamish love today. We're talking about the kind of love that met Naomi and Ruth at the place of their pain and created a story that's still being told to this day because it is a story that so captures the essence, power, and magnitude of the love of Jesus toward you and me. The story of Ruth, to know it, you have to start with the story of Naomi and her husband who lived in Bethlehem, and they moved out of Bethlehem because of the need that was happening there. They moved to Moab. And so while in Moab, uh, Naomi suffered the loss of her husband. And just that alone creates a need that only the power of God's love can meet. But to add to that, in the next 10 years, she will lose both of her sons. While in Moab, they get married and they're doing life. But 10 years in, Naomi has lost her husband and her two sons, and now we read that 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 experience is shaping her identity. She even changes her name, a name that means bitterness. I get that. When you go through something like she was going through, how do your experiences not shape the way you think, the way you act, the way you react, the way you view the world, the way you view God, the way you view life? But what I'm showing you today is that there was a love that met her, that renewed her identity as a daughter of God, as a daughter of hope and a daughter of a future. So we're talking about a rock solid love. A few weeks ago I told you that in my growing up Christmas tradition, our cousins, we'd exchange names and on Christmas Eve at Memaw's house, you would give that cousin a gift if you had drawn their name. We had just, you know, a monetary amount. It wasn't a large amount, something everybody could afford. And, and you would get a gift. And, you know, I'm just a kid and look forward to that because you look forward to getting, getting toys. And so I told you that there was one year he got me a movie, a VHS, that would go in the VCR. Remember, we had, it was in the days of Blockbuster, but I couldn't believe when he told me when I said to him, man, I love this movie. This is going to be great. He said, great, because it's due back in two days. He rented my Christmas gift. So, uh, yeah. So a few years later, he gets my name again. And when, when I walk in and it's gift time, he hands me an envelope. It's got a rock in it. And you got to understand that my mamaw's driveway was all gravel. And just before gift exchange, he just ran out to to the driveway, grabbed a rock, threw it in an envelope that Memo gave him and told me that cavemen back in the day would give each other a rock if they really liked each other. And so gave me a rock from the driveway. It was a little rock, small rock, and nothing, you know, I had thoughts about what we would do with that rock because back in that day, we didn't have, you know, all the, all the game stations, we, we played outside, and uh, we would throw rocks. And I, the only good thing, the only good thought I had, because my parents said, you will be grateful or you will have your name blotted out of the book of life. <laughs> you will be grateful or you will get it. One time I wasn't grateful, and, and there was no time out, pause and reflect. It's what I called snatch, smack, pause, reflect. Snatch, smack, pause. You got snatched up, taken to the bathroom. Smack, smack, I'm crying. Pause, you better quit crying. I'm gonna spank you again. <laughs> Reflect. Because we're going back in there and you will say thank you. So in that moment, I wasn't grateful for the rock, but I'd learned you gotta fix your mind on the good things. And I was thinking, I'm gonna use that rock, I'm gonna throw it at my cousin, but God has forgiven me of that. And so I'm not talking about some small thing. I, I want you to think about a mountain today. I want you to think about a, the rock of Gibraltar. I want you to think about a love that is so rock solid that it could help someone where Naomi was. It could help someone where Ruth was. Because the Bible says that 
Naomi made a decision to go back to Bethlehem. She hasn't settled her questions. She hasn't renewed her perspective. She is still dealing with the bitterness and she's identified by that bitterness, but she makes a choice to go back to Bethlehem. The context helps us here because Bethlehem means the house of bread. So she's going back to the bread. It's barley harvest and it is time now, prime time for there to be bread and she's going back to the bread. For you and I, the New Testament reality is a person who's gone through pain and you got separated in your relationship with Jesus. It's, you're not where you were. You're distant, you're disconnected. And even with your struggles, questions, and pain, you make a choice, I'm going back to the bread. Jesus is the bread. And you're going back to Jesus. You don't have to figure it all out. You don't have to reconcile the situation. You just say, I'm going back to Jesus because only the love of Jesus has the capacity to meet you when your soul is struggling and it's the love of God that's like a rock that you can find help and hope and you can build. You can build from it. You can build on it. Naomi could have said, life is over. I'm just existing. I will just survive until my time is up. But she's going back to the bread. If you'll go back to Jesus, you'll find that even in the most intense struggle, there will be a ministry of hope, a ministry of love, a ministry of help, because the love of God has the capacity. That's why it's not a squishy love. I'm not talking about a, a pipe dream. I'm talking about something that meets you in the raw aspects of the human experience and gives you that sense that things can get better. Today, when I give the opportunity to pray, there's some of you here for just this moment, just this point, and that point is come back to the bread, come home, come to Jesus, come back into a relationship with him. Walk it out with him. Struggle through it with him. Process through it with him. Here's what you've discovered if you've allowed bitterness to take you over. Bitterness is magnetic just like the love of God is magnetic. Whatever defines you is what you will draw to you. If you allow your identity to be marked with anger, frustration, and insecurity, I promise you, you have set your mind to capture any and everything throughout your days that will challenge, trigger, and feed that bitterness, insecurity, everything will make you mad. Every TV show you watch, every news show, Every time you go on social media, you'll come right along Boogaloo 74, who's never said anything nice in, in the, the, the history of being, and I hope you're not Boogaloo 74, dear God, I hope that's not you, but uh, <laughs> I'll see y'all later. Have a great Christmas. I'm going to another church, because Boogaloo 74 will definitely go to another church. You know what I'm saying. You weren't even looking for that, but... You, you, when you define yourself and let experience like that define you, it sets your perspective and everything will feed that. Just like on the other side, if you allow the love of God to define you, you will set your mind in such a way that there are things like a magnet will be drawn to you that feed that identity. Now I'm not saying you have the power to change that, I'm saying you have the power to choose to reconcile your relationship with Jesus. To say I make a fresh surrender, not commitment, surrender. Just surrender. And watch the ministry of his love start changing you from the inside out. Instead of allowing your mind to dictate to your spirit who you are. The love of God works in your spirit and your spirit says to your mind, we're gonna think on these things. Things that are lovely, pure, of a good report, things that are noble. That is the power 
of the love of God. Then as they go back to Bethlehem, they not only have to survive, they've got to go forward, they have to build a life. And I want you to see that this love, you can build on it. And Ruth says to Naomi, she's the only daughter-in-law that came back. Ruth said, I'm going where you go. I'm committed to you. I'm in a covenant. I'm going. And so she does, and, and it is Ruth that says, I'm going to go out and glean. Now, the way the, the story goes is in the context, if you had bankruptcy, loss, struggle, you could go to a, any field, and as you entered that field during bar harvest, they were to leave some in certain places and piles, and you could glean from that so that you could start rebuilding your life. And the Bible says that Ruth just happened into a field. She, does, she didn't know the owner of the field, who is Boaz. She's just happened into a field to get some barley. She's going to end up meeting Boaz, a kinsman redeemer. This is the love of God working behind the scenes, coordinating. This is the love of God out in front. This is the love of God stirring the heart of Naomi, who was in Moab, saying, it's time to go back to Bethlehem. When you make that choice of going back to Jesus, that's Jesus stirring that in you. And as you start responding, he's yet got the next move in place. And you think you're just happening into places and spaces, but it's a God thing. See, when you start reorienting your life, you then, you, you, are, you are drawing things to you that are being set up in the spiritual realm by the love of God to help you rebuild your life in the physical. So she happens into a field. How many blessings have you experienced in your life and it seemed like you just happened into it? But now you know that was the love of God. Can you join me in praising him that his love is that awesome? The capacity of the love of God that was out in front setting things up. So as she goes to glean, we learn this, that the love of God is strong enough to help you to glean while you grieve. Please know that it's not a love like that little rock I got from my mamaw's driveway at the exchange moment in gift giving. It's a Gibraltar. It has the capacity to help you to glean while you process, while you grieve. My sister-in-law will move into this Christmas, it'll be her second Christmas to go through without her husband. Her husband died at a young age and this unexpected situation, diagnosis. And she posted something that I think is worthy of sharing with you. And I want you to see it. I'm going to put it on the screen for you. So here we go. My emotions have been all over the place the last week or so. There's nothing that frustrates me more about myself than that. But I haven't tried to figure it out. Instead, I just stay in the moment. Apply what I know to be true, knowing Jesus is right here with me and I'm, I'm going to be okay. Now, before I move forward, go back to that screen, please just switch it back. You see where she's gleaning while she's grieving. Do you see her choice in that? You're about to see the Lord's response of his love, but do you see her choice? I'm hurting. I'm struggling. Everybody will go through hurt and pain. Here's the, the question. Will we choose to keep going to Jesus or will we harden our heart toward him, uh, blame him, hold him accountable, distance ourselves, get defined by the experience and become bitter? And then that fills our home, that fills, if you're married, it'll fill the space between you and your spouse, you and your kids. Let's get real today. Your kids will be going through things in their life at school and it's nothing more than what's happening in the home. 
They don't have the capacity to understand it. They feel that they experience it. But that they haven't matured enough to know that you're working through something. There's a choice to make here of do you keep applying what you know to be true, knowing Jesus is right here. Now, next slide, let's go. Worship music has been my partner in crime against the lies of my thoughts and feelings that seem to overwhelm me at any moment. The lyrics straight from scripture that declared the goodness and faithfulness of God. Watch this. Receiving the goodness and faithfulness of God while in the natural, the mind would say, well, where is his goodness and where was his faithfulness? But you go to what you know to be true. What you know to be true, you're not gonna let your feelings lead you. You're going to demand your feelings to ultimately come into line with truth. The lyrics straight from scripture that declare the goodness and faithfulness of God always keep my heart and my mind in check. Thank you, Joanne, for not just saying, makes it all right. It checks me. It reminds me that I've got a response here. Here we go. Between worship and prayer and taking one moment and each day at a time, I'm winning. I'm so grateful for God's word. I'm grateful for the gifted songwriters and for the ability to turn on worship and tune out the negativity. Thank you, Joanne, for the description. You tune out. If you remember the day of tuning a radio to a certain station and you had to turn the dial, it was a process of coming through the static and getting the frequency aligned so that it opened up the sound without interference and without distraction. You, you are tuning, gleaning while you grieve is continuing to tune your heart to truth where there is the clarity of God's character and nature influencing you, therefore tuning out the negativity. Notice it's called gleaning from a different field. Next, I'm grateful for my family, my friends, my church. I'm so very grateful for Jesus. If you're struggling, just want to encourage you. You can do this because storms don't last forever. Joanne's oldest son is now the pastor of the church that Joanne and her husband David started years ago. They still meet in a public high school auditorium. They have purchased land and soon will start a building that will be the home of the church. But until then, every Sunday at 5.15, the, the truck and trailer pulls up and they start unloading. They unload every crib that is set up in the space that's the nursery. They unload the flooring and all of the toys that's used for preschool. They unload everything that sets up the elementary and then on the main stage, the drums, the guitars, the technology that's involved in all of this set up. And so Joanne's on the team. She leads the team and, and participates in cooking a full breakfast every Sunday morning for the dream team that comes and loads that in. She then usually goes to the keyboard and plays during the worship service, then participates creating and preparing a meal for the dream team that loads that all back up that doesn't leave the church until two o'clock on a Sunday afternoon, she, she could sit at home. I mean, after all, she's paid her dues. She could sit at home, or she could sit some of that out. But she is living from and building from a love of God so strong that while she's grieving, she's still serving. And the Bible is clear and we're watching it happen in her life and she's modeling it for us that there's a place where God is healing you and you're, you're, you're gleaning at a level of just prayer and going to God in personal worship. But then there's a time to get back involved because the next level of healing is as you give, you receive. As you give, you receive. As you serve through your tears, 
you're receiving a healing work of Jesus. Who am I talking to today? Are you hearing this? This is the real, this is real talk about how life works. I, I would encourage you to know the power of the love of God that will meet you, that will allow you to just, you just keep moving forward. You keep moving forward. Moving forward may be opening your Bible, turning on the worship music. Moving forward may be the stage for you where you get back involved and, and you serve. The older we get, the more tears we will have in our faith because life will see to it to challenge your concept of God, your faith in God, and a situation will happen and it will try and tear a hole in your faith. But when you keep turning to the love of God to glean from your relationship with Jesus and the promise of God, and you stay in service and you even serve through your pain, the love of God heals the tears in your faith. I have watched Joanne personally be on a stage playing the keyboard and she's weeping. And one reason she's weeping is because of the presence of God. And the other reason is her husband is not there. And it's what they did together. It was so significant in the life they lived. So it's a, it's a reminder every day, and especially on a Sunday, that it is so different now. But there she is, and our entire family would tell you that she loves like no other. And the only reason that can happen is because she is receiving a love like no other. This may be the point for you. Let me put it back up. Glean while you grieve. When I give the altar call, you may want to come and say, okay, I'm going to do that. I'm allowing this thing to overtake me and shape my thinking. I'm going to say to Jesus, I'm going to make a move. And I want to tell you, we'll be cheering you on. We'll stand with you. We'll lock arms with you. We'll re weep while you reap and weep and rejoice while you rejoice. We will, we'll walk it out. Let's walk it out because you have no idea all you would be happening into to come with your struggle to prayer and worship and serving. You have no idea what may open up. And that takes us to the next part of this story. And I'll segue into it by just saying, I feel this in my heart. Hear the words of Jeremiah that God has loved you with an everlasting love. That's the Gibraltar that Paul said, this love is so amazing, nothing can separate you from it. Death, peril, hardship, pain, nothing can separate you from the love of God. Oh, love of God, how rich, how pure, how measureless and strong. Aren't you thankful for the love that can confront the kind of fear that we face, the kind of grief that we go through? Go through it. It is God's gift to you to be able to grieve through pain so that you can recalibrate and move forward but the stages of grief that go everything from loss to anger to discouragement, you can get stuck in one of those. And it will, it will define you. And it is the love of God that is allowing you to come through all of that so that you can move forward. I'm saying to you that the love of God is the only thing that has the capacity upon which you can find a source and a resource for all that's going on inside of you. The turmoil, the upheaval, it is the love of God that's a settling, healing, delivering power in your life. 
Let's break the moment with faith in the love of God with a clap offering that that's going to happen for somebody today. They're going to start gleaning while they grieve. Now we go to Ruth chapter 4. We're going to read some scripture, but i got to give you the context. In their day, if you suffered the loss like Naomi, the loss of her husband, then the next of kin had opportunity to purchase your land, pay your debt, return it back to you, and marry you. And that person would be called a kinsman redeemer, a guardian redeemer. And so when we come to chapter 4, we're going to see that Boaz, who saw Ruth gleaning in the field, Ruth didn't know Boaz, didn't know that it was Boaz's field, but Boaz knew about Ruth and knew about the story of Ruth. And so Boaz is going to act in a way to become her redeemer. Before we read a word, I want you to know that God demonstrated his love toward us in this, that while we were sinners, he gave his son. And Jesus became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. The debt could not be canceled. Your sin debt and mine could not be canceled. It had to be transferred. And it had to be paid for. It had to be, that's what redemption means. And so the justice of God would not allow just the mercy of God to cancel it. Mercy would have canceled it. Justice would have never allowed it to be paid. But justice and mercy can't collide. They have to meet. And they met in the person called Jesus Christ. And when Jesus went to the cross, the reason Paul says he's canceled your debt, listen to the next part of the verse, having nailed it to the cross. It was transferred to Jesus. Can you put up 2 Corinthians 8 and 9? Just jump to that. I've got to make the most of my time. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes became poor, so that you through his poverty, his death, might become rich. If you've been raised around church for any length of time, you've heard the song, It Is Well, My Sin, Oh, the Bliss of This Glorious Thought, that my sin, not in part, but the whole, all of it, was nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Anybody here thankful that the debt of your sin was transferred? And once it was transferred, it was paid in full by the shed blood, the precious blood. We're not redeemed with things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Boaz finds the next of kin. Boaz is not the next of kin. He goes to that person and says, you're, you're the next of kin to then be the redeemer. And the next of kin says, I'll do it. I'll pay, pay Naomi's debt. I'll return her land to her and I will marry her. And Boaz says, but Ruth has returned with her. And in the context and the custom, you have to do the same for Ruth. And the next of kin said, I can't do that. I, I, don't, I don't have the money. I can't. The next of kin was willing but couldn't. And the whole story is theirs to show you. We'd love to redeem ourselves, but we can't. There comes a point where we would deliver ourselves if we could. See, we can't earn this and we don't have what it takes to pay for this. Humanity could not redeem humanity. So a kinsman redeemer stepped in and said, you can't. But like Boaz, Jesus said, I'm willing and I can pay the debt. And the custom was that Boaz would have to gather 10 judiciaries and they would watch the transaction happen so that they could validate that it was legal. 10. 10 that would make sure that the transaction was just. Those 10 represent the 10 commandments that on our best day, we're gonna mess up with one of them. 
And so we could never satisfy, watch this, the judiciary, the justice of God. So Jesus, he is the high priest and, and he is the one that represented the law and the prophets. When he goes to the cross, he is the one who did live up to the expectation. He could not have one aspect of sin. He became sin. The one who knew no sin became sin. Let the deep theology of what you see in Boaz and Ruth remind you that Jesus was a substitute. He took our place. Jesus was a justifier. Jesus was the redeemer. And it's like reading Ruth is just watching a movie that never uses the word justification or propitiation or substitutionary atonement. But every page, it is just shouting the theological underpinnings of who Christ is and what he has done. He stepped in to our place. Boaz says, I will pay it. And this is where we're going to pick up the story. And we're going to pick it up in verse 9. Then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, Today you are witnesses that I bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilion, and Malon. I've also acquired the Ruth the Moabite, Malon's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property so that his name will not disappear from among his people or from his hometown. Today, you are my witnesses. So it was established. Redemption had happened. She's been purchased by the kinsman redeemer. Now watch, verse 11. Then the elders and all the people at the gate said, we are witnesses. And they said, may the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah who together built up the family of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. All right, all right, all right. Shake a minute, because we're about to go down a road that will leave you so overwhelmed at the love of God. I want to break this down for us so that we really see what it is we're reading. Do you know that Ruth, she's a Moabitess. She's from Moab, do you realize that Moab, the, the person who from his legacy and lineage came all the Moabites, do you know where Moab came from? Let me, re, let me remind you that Lot, the compromiser, his own daughters get him drunk. And in an incestuous Relationship comes from one daughter, Ammon, and from another daughter, Moab. And Ruth is born out of that line, a Moabitess. So when she comes to Bethlehem, she has no claim for anything. There's nothing that will be offered she is without hope. She's an outlier. She's alienated. But she happens into a field of someone who would become the kinsman redeemer. And the moment she's redeemed, she's viewed just like Rachel and Leah. Well, who are they? They are the ones from which the 12 sons that became the 12 tribes of Israel. Rachel and Leah, essential and significant to the dynamic growth and future of Israel. And because justification has happened in the life of Ruth, because redemption has happened, those judiciaries say, may she be like Rachel and Leah. May she be famous, meaning she now is going to become necessary for the advancement of the nation. And oh, she does. 
Let me pause right here and say, I guess the power of God's love is greater than our history. I guess the power of God's love is greater than immorality and greater than any sin. And when you get saved and redeemed by the blood of Jesus, you are brought into his family called the church. And you're not brought in as a rookie and maybe, just maybe, you'll make it to varsity. You're not brought in on some spiritual probation. You are justified, just as if you never did it. And now you become key for the advancement of the kingdom of God through the testimony that has come by the blood of the Lamb in your life. Let's add verse 12. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, May your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. Tamar? Tamar, who's listed in Matthew 1. Tamar, who's listed in Luke as it's given the genealogy, the direct line to the Messiah. Tamar? Tamar, who posed as a prostitute and seduced her father-in-law and gave birth to Perez. And in Matthew 1, you see Perez's name and Tamar's name that's leading down to, and then, oh, holy night. Oh, the stars are brightly shining because there is a Savior born, and in the direct line is Ruth, who's a Moabitess, who came from such sin. Boaz is mentioned. Do you know who Boaz's mother is? Rahab, come on, we're about to break this wide open. Rahab was a prostitute, but put her trust in God. And so then when you read about the genealogy, there's Tamar, and Perez means breakthrough, because when you, when you submit to God, there's a breakthrough. And your past is not your future. And then there is Boaz, because Ruth put, or Rahab put her trust in God, and now he ends up as a kinsman redeemer to a Moabitess who gets redeemed, my God, grafted in. And do you know when Ruth and Boaz have a son, you know his name? Obed. When Obed grows up, gets married, he gives birth to who? Jesse. And then Jesse gets married and gives birth to David. King David, root of David, out of which will come who? The Messiah. So there is nothing greater than this rock-solid love of God. Do you see what I mean? You can build on it. You can build from it. You can dream big. But what about all of this shame and pain? No, no, no. It's been redeemed. Your talents, your personality, your giftings, your destiny can be released. Yes, yes, yes. My God, you mean I'm actually forgiven? You mean I'm, I'm not just kind of tacked in? Because you, you know, drunkenness and adultery and prostitution and all this immorality. Maybe you're sitting here going, man, come on, God, why are you using all these wicked people? You want to know the answer? He always uses wicked people. Do you know why? It's all he has. It's all he has. Thank you for clapping because it means you get it. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. Not a person in this room had to commit one sin to be a sinner. We were shapen, born in iniquity. The fall of man made us a wretch and wrecked and sinful. And then we just acted out of who we were, whether it be drunkenness or immorality or whatever. We're just a bunch of sinners. And one day Jesus came to us and it didn't matter my history. He came with a love greater and he lifted me out of a deep and a dark and a evil place 
and he set me on a rock. His rock is his love. And he said, now come on, you're my church now. Build, build, build. Go, expand, move forward, my. This is so awesome. This is so amazing. Grace isn't on the merit. Oh, did you see, did you see that in chapter four, we never seen Ruth present? She's not even present in chapter four because Ruth couldn't merit this. Ruth wasn't doing anything. This is all on the merits of another. Redemption is to the justice of God, payment made. Redemption is for the separation of man from God. Redemption is by the willingness of Jesus Christ to have all of our sin transferred to him and then to give his perfect life so that payment could be made. He mounted a cross. He died in our place. And now his love. One prophet said, speaking of the cross, that behind that veil, all through the ages, people have been crying out for mercy. But, but mercy was captured behind the veil. But when Jesus died at the cross, on the cross, mercy and grace met. I mean, mercy and justice met. And the veil was rent. And mercy took off running and started finding prodigals and prostitutes and sinners and alcoholics and drug addicts. Mercy took off running and found Ron Woods <laughs> and forgave him, forgave him, found you. It's just that awesome. I want the worship team to come. This is a holy, sacred moment. Just close your eyes in the holiness, the beauty of his holiness. What's the holiness of God? It's the love of God. The beauty of holiness it was where we see the one who took our place. He loved us that much. Momentarily, I'm gonna give an altar call for people that need to come back to the bread. These are those saved, but need to have a fresh surrender, come back into that walk with Jesus. You come back to truth. I will give an altar call for people who are willing to glean while they grieve. You're hurting, but you're gonna let the love of God help you. Finally, hear me, finally, you're gonna let the love of God help you. You're fighting with yourself. You're fighting with your own thoughts. You're fighting. You're in turmoil. Surrender and glean from the field of the promise of God. And then I'll give an altar call for people who have never accepted Jesus and you're so worn out because you've been looking for what I've explained today. You have heard and seen that the answer is Jesus and you get the opportunity to respond out of that desperation and urgency for Jesus to be your personal savior, your redeemer. Your sins forgiven, your life changed and then you become the son of God, the daughter of God. And to as many as become the sons and daughters of God, he gives you the power to build the life. You just happened in church today. You just happened in church. And Jesus was setting it all up. God, in this sacred space and moment, would you have every person ready to respond that nothing would distract them, nothing would keep them from your highest and your best, nothing. 
I see even now, God, that this altar is going to become that place of so many people letting the love of God be lavished out on them again, 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 again. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want to sing just one time through about how we're going to build our life. We're going to build it on the love of God.